hi, got a video sharing my software and a little bit about how it works in Traktor. Obviously, I will pull a link to the software so that you can download it. Feel free to do whatever you want with it. Um, hopefully, people can make it better and we can all share it and uh, everybody can use it. So let's just quickly go through. So we basically have all our variables that we set up at the beginning. Um, pretty standard, really. I've put some comments on some sections. So this section here is where we actually specify the inputs and the outputs. So if you do decide to change the pinouts from what I've used, you can change these values to match the pins and you shouldn't have any problems. So as we scroll down, so the first two sections are how we process MIDI in and MIDI out. So basically the program monitors all MIDI channels. You can change it to specify to monitor only certain channels, but there is a reason for this, which I found out. So basically what it does, we have a switch case. So it looks for a value. Value is the MIDI note that's sent from Traktor. So if we go to Control Manager and we look at um, Q, for example, um, let's look at Q button out. So Q out is sending note E1. In this case, because I'm working on deck two, it's going out on channel two. Um, you can change all of this. There is an option to change the channel number in the software, which you'll need to do if you want to run two decks. The reason that we monitor all of them is because there are some issues with how it detects the teens is, and sometimes it sees one as number one and one as number two. So if we specify general MIDI, all ports, program it on all inputs and all outputs, it will look for the commands from both decks. Then all we need to do is just put channel one on one, channel two on another, and, uh, and away we go. It doesn't matter what order it sees them when they come in. So like I say, for sending out LEDs, um, we just send it out on the specific note. Um, so in this case, it's D1. If we count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26 is D1. If we go back to the teensy, 26 is coming in and we are turning on the Q LED. You don't have to do it this way. You could just basically say, when I see number one, turn on the Q LED. I tried to do it so that it makes sense with the buttons but it was actually a bit harder because of um, having to search with the notes. So it might be easier to just say case one, program it to switch on whatever LED that you want it to, to, to receive when you send command number one. Um, so we can see all the LEDs are being switched on here. We have one special case. So if I do send number one, it turns the loop in and the loop out LEDs on so that when we activate a loop, with the loop in, loop out, or with the loop one, two, three, or four, we can just switch them both on. I have some things that I want to do with that, like I want to make them flash when loops are active, which I've got to figure out, but that's all part of Traktor figuring out. The commands are here to turn the LEDs on, and then we have the same commands here, which is to turn the LEDs off, so we're just setting them low. So that that's pretty straightforward. You just need to add case numbers in there to match the commands that you're sending from Traktor. And once you've got a case, you just then say, turn on whatever you want to turn on. And you could do more than one thing as well. You could have a whole routine there if you want to. So carrying on, we've got the normal setup stuff. Set your board rate. This is for the MIDI data. If you set it to the wrong value, it will basically just not do anything. The, the thing just stops working. Um, then we've got setting our pin modes for LED outputs and we put the same values in here. That's why earlier on we specify all of these numbers so that we can use the same variables all the way through to make life easier for ourselves. 
uh, digital right 13 is just turning on the onboard LED which is useful so that I know things are working. We've got analog read average which is supposed to help smoothing but it doesn't really do much. Um, power supplies are not that good for analog reading so you do get lots of variations in it and we've got some coding in it later on to actually help with that. Uh, we need to basically just set up the MIDI commands in and out as well. So if you're doing any CC uh, commands for turning LEDs then you need to have the relevant routines for those. I've rammed out all of the data for the LCD stuff that I've been working on because you don't need that at the minute. So now we're on to the actual main loop. So the first thing we do is we MIDI read all channels. So we're reading everything on all channels. First thing after that is we're reading the analog inputs, which is the pitch control and the, the break adjust. Um, the break adjust, you can do whatever you want with it. It's just a command. I made it zoom in and out, probably change it at some point. But what we've got here is what's called a moving average routine. So rather than doing what I was originally doing, which is reading it 10 times and finding the average reading of those 10 times, which took 10 cycles, we're basically only reading it once, and every time that the program cycles through, it regenerates the average based on the values that are in the last X number of readings, and you can specify that with the num readings value. So it will always generate the average from the last 10 readings, which means we only need to read everything once. Saves on processing time, which in this case is latency, which is very important. So we've got number four, which is the pitch bend, uh, pitch control and we're using the pitch bend command which will actually send a 14-bit value so on this case the average is coming in now when you read an analog signal on a teensy it's between 0 and 1024 but we need to multiply that because a 14-bit value is up to 16,000 so we times that value by 16.015 to send a true 14-bit value there are also things in uh, routines in here which basically um, look to see if the last value is different from the current one. If it's not different, don't send anything. If it is different, we send something. The idea is that we're not constantly sending MIDI commands if we don't need to. So if we keep a button pressed down, it sends that the button's pressed down, but it doesn't send anything else until the button's let go. And then it sends the button let go. You have to put auto repeat in on the tractor side of things. So that's what that section is doing there. It's basically reading the last X amount of readings from the analog inputs and working out an average so that we can smooth the buttons out, the, the analog controls out, and then only sending changes when they happen. So the next section is regards to reading the but what I call the button arrays. So we've got um, four arrays that are going on at the moment, which I did outlined in the picture, and I've actually labeled them in here as well. Ignore this section, this is all to do with the LCD configuration, which we don't need to worry about at the moment. So I've labeled them as they're labeled on Pioneer, KD3, keyboard loop three, I'm, I'm guessing. So in this case, KD3 is the time mode button, the loop in button, the loop out button, the exit loop. So what happens is with, with this is we have a resistor which goes from the five volt to the analog input, and then that also connects to ground. So if you didn't have anything else on, it would always read 1024. Um, so basically, with no buttons pressed, it's reading 1024. If you don't do that, the teensies go and have a Mardi because it doesn't think there's anything connected. So that's the first thing that you do. Then you actually connect um, the output of the button at the top, which is how I've specified it on um, the diagram, which is the one... Um, which is the first in the loop. So it goes memory, call, quick return. Um, that's, that's the order. And every button has got a, a different resistor value. So because we have a higher resistor value going before the buttons, whatever we press on this will always be um, a lower resistor value. So the signal follows the path of least resistance. So whichever button we press it will literally change the resistance value on the analog reading but because it fluctuates when the button's pressed when the button's let go we need to look for a range of keys and basically this could be different every time that you do this because of the buttons and things like that 
um, and depending on what resistor you use. So this is definitely a bit of trial and error. Um, if you use the um, monitor, so if you go to tools and serial monitor and just print whatever your readings are, I'm making note of them, it's fairly straightforward. It shouldn't be too much different from what I've got on here. So if we're saying if, if it's less than 50, we send we say key is 74. If it's greater than 200 and less than 300, it's 75. Um, so then when we get to the end, we basically say if key is greater than zero, we've pressed a key. Has that key different to the last key? Yes, it is. Send the command. We have a delay at the end, which we might not need anymore, but I've still got it, just so that it doesn't start to repeat itself. Basically, if we have pressed a key, but it's not different to the last time, we don't do anything. If we haven't pressed a key, and it basically we've let go of the keys, we then send the note off command. So this is the same all the way through. We only send the command when we press the key, which is on. We don't send the off until the key is let go. So we're not constantly sending MIDI commands. So this is repeated for each of the sections as we go down. It's quite straightforward, really. Uh, very clever. You can you can be precise as you want on there, depending on how smooth your power supply is. Out of all of this, there is an actual option to use a proper analog digital converter, a sampler, which has better control over these readings. So that is definitely something that I'm going to look into. So that's the key arrays. So now we actually have the digital inputs. Um, same thing again, only send keys when they've changed. Um, and we've got a delay afterwards. Again, we might not need that anymore. In fact, I don't think we do. But um, we've got Q, play, and the jog wheel. There is a bit of logic on the jog wheel as well, which I'll explain. But let's go down to the actual jog encoder now. So at the very top, you need to have encoder.h, which is the built-in routine. And that makes things so much easier. You just um, give it the do in the setup. No, it's at the very top. Specify which pins the encoder wheel is connected to. In this case, it's 10 and 11. And then the value comes in on new wheel. So it's actually possible to get an absolute value of the jog wheel from when it's first switched on. So when it's first switched on, uh, wheel pause will be zero. And it goes up and down depending on which way you move it. But I couldn't get a tractor to respond to this because the jog wheel does not work with a 14-bit resolution. So we have to work on relative, basically, if we're going forwards or backwards. Um, so this is the actual routine that works out the velocity with the milli command. How many ticks are we moving? And I'm limiting it to 60 at the minute. This definitely needs a lot of work. But the reason I'm lim limiting it to 60 it's because of the command that we're using in Tractor. So if we go to Jog Turn, there are two modes, 7FH01H, 3FH41H. I originally was using 3FH41H. That is basically if it's 64 or less, go backwards, 65 or more, go forwards, without actual any variables on there. If we use 7FH, O and H, then we can actually specify the speed that we're actually turning. So if we have um, the jog button pressed, scratch mode, let's say, we send a velocity of 127, which is the slowest to go forwards, minus the velocity of the wheel. So that's basically 127 minus a maximum value of 60 which would be as fast as you want, as it could possibly go. If the jog wheel is not pressed down, then I, I'm literally sending the slowest action so that you can nudge. Um, all these things can be tweaked. We need to tweak it inside tractor as well. So if we go to the jog turn, we have rotary sensitivity. So I'm just using the outer wheel but it can still go quite fast. And then when we've got the jog pressed down. So this rotary sensitivity can control how fast we 
let's see how quick that's move that's working. Take that all the way down. We've also got acceleration. So there's lots of options to tweak. I found at the moment around about 20% is pretty good, but it needs lots of tweaking so that it works as close as possible. Ideally, I'd like to get um, a normal CDJ set up on deck A, this one on deck B, and just keep tweaking until I get it working as it should do. But um, it's all based around this velocity and then sending um, the relevant command. So like I say, 127 is moved forwards in the slowest speed. One is moved backwards in the slowest speed and then you use the velocity to change that. Um, we've then got some flags for the jog wheel, which I think are wrong at the moment, but it works close enough. So basically we want to know, is the jog pressed? Yes, it is. Is the jog pressed and the wheel is moving? Is the wheel moving and we've let go of the jog? Um, again, this might not be needed anymore, but I haven't got around to taking it out. And the idea behind this was when we let go of the jog wheel, we want the wheel to carry on moving like a CDJ does. So when I initially had a delay um, so that we could slow down the outer nudge, it wasn't working very well and we couldn't do the spin. But now, it follows the jog wheel better. So these might not be needed, but I'm just going to leave them in for the minute. And then at the end, we have a small delay, um, which hopefully once everything's set up, we can set that as low as possible because that will just keep the latency down. But the latency is pretty good at the moment, to be fair. Um, I don't think you could go wrong with that really. Uh, so there we go. Um, so I've got loads and loads of things that I want to do. I want to make buttons flash, um, but it's completely configurable and basically everything is configured within Tractor, um, which makes things nice and easy. So let's just have a quick look at um, some of the things that we've got in here. So like loop size actuator. Um, the guides are, are really good on DJ Tech Tools for all of this and how to set all these up. We've got some modifiers in here. So reverse button is a modifier. I'm using modifier value number one. So basically when I press reverse it changes the loops from loops to hotkeys. One of the things I want to do is when that reverse is done it reprograms the LEDs so that they show which hot keys uh, hot cues are set um, but I haven't figured that bit out yet and then we also have vinyl button uh, which is a shift for kind of everything so we could make all the buttons do more than two things but um, I need to change that let's have a quick look uh, basically I need to change that so that it's only done when you keep your finger down on it um, I will also give you the export of this. At the moment it only has the deck being there because I need to redo all the software for my other one, which has got a slightly different board, but I didn't see the point in trying to maintain two until I finished doing this one. And then I copied across, duplicate all the things for deck A and deck B. And um, yeah, so that's pretty much the software. Um, like I say, if anybody knows how to do things in a better way. If you uh, if you want to ask questions, you can still get me on the DJ Tech Tools. Thanks everybody that's actually watched the video. I was really surprised how well uh, it's been received. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to seeing some cool stuff from people. Um, I recently been messing about with some other stuff and I have a long-term project of making uh, a, a mixer um, with some really nice uh, LEDs that I found which are really easy to work with and um, yeah thanks again like I say thanks for watching and uh, I'll keep you all up to date